Larry Souter, and welcome to Stories of Amazing Grace. We're coming to you from Bixter Chapel at the Madison Church of Christ in Madison, Tennessee. Thank you for joining us on YouTube by way of radio and for our live audience. Our theme scripture comes from Romans 8, 38 through 39. I'm sure that nothing can separate us from God's love. Not life or death, not angels or spirits, not the present or the future, and not powers above or powers below. Nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Fried chicken, <laughs> baked fish, meatloaf, country ham, <laughs> green beans, that. corn, Parmesan tomatoes, candied yams, <laughs> turnip greens, mashed potatoes and gravy, strawberry shortcake, banana pudding, peach cobbler, cherry cobbler, blackberry cobbler, and apple fritters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> are you hungry yet? <laughs> Those are some of the items on the menu at the Hermitage House Smorgasbord. We couldn't bring the food or those desserts, but we do have a dessert tonight in the form of Margaret Crosser. <coughs> and you're going to hear her story tonight. So come on up and let's hear it. Thank you for being with us. Well, we have to go. A little applause for it. <laughs> Got a little older. <laughs> Give me your hand, too. All right, thank you. Got a little age on me, you all. Yeah. You know, yeah. Or are we revealing what the age is? So I never, I never mind telling my age. I just don't tell my weight. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm my age? 88. 88. Yes, wow. sir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and this is you at your happiest, this picture right here, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know about restaurants. I'm in a restaurant business, not by choice. <laughs> All right, late. thank you so much for coming. My family, Madison, when I came in 1971 from Pennsylvania with maybe 100 members, 3,000 people singing, you know, Amazing Grace and, and uh, Dr. Aaron Orr saying, we love you, we want you, we need you. I will never forget that. When you come from the mission field, you're starved. And here's a man that says, we want you, we love you, we need you. My best days of my life is, is coming to Madison. Well, let's talk about, thank you. Oh, well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> they appreciate you. But you started out in uh, Eastern Europe, and we have a map. Yeah. That little green country right there, Slovak, Slo Slovakia. Slovak, yeah, right there. That's, little, where, you, that's mm -hmm. where you came from. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that country. Well, Czechoslovakia, wonderful country, but you know, they had to separate. So the Czechs are in the north and the Slovaks are in the south. So now neither have, neither one of them have a loaf of bread, now half and half. But America is united and the world doesn't learn. Why don't they look at us? They're all jealous of us because we have accomplished a lot, but we do it because we're united. What was it like there growing up? The life? Mm -hmm. Well, before Hitler came, it was great. Yeah. Because our first president came to America and he fell in love with American ideology. You know, government for the people, of the people. And so for 20 years, we had a wonderful economy. Everything went great until Hitler arose and he said, he's going to liberate us. We were, we were free, but anyhow. That's what dictators make you believe. He's going to liberate you anyhow. Yeah, they're going to... Yeah. <laughs> going to take away what you enjoy, yes. <laughs> we have a shot here of uh, the mountain scenes. Uh -huh. It's in black and white that you gave me. Is this oh, near yeah. where you live? No, this is the village where the Germans, I was deported by the Germans, and I was liberated by the 101st Airborne. And that's where the Germans dropped us off in the, in the village in the Alps. And there's mm -hmm. a shot here of an older lady and a younger girl. Who are now, these people? That is my aunt, but she, was not, she didn't like us. My father's sisters, he had three sisters, and they were, they were mean to us. But that was me around four or five years old. Oh, yeah. really? My, my mother was orphaned, and, you know, you don't know nobody when you're an orphan. And so they, they looked down upon us. So I know what it is to, be, to feel rejected. It hurts. But you, it was family. You grew up in poverty? 
Yes, my father worked. He neglected his education, and if you don't have education, you're not going to have a good job. So he had to go to work in the factory. But one thing I don't understand, my father worked for 40 years faithfully. He only missed three days. Never made enough of living to pay rent, buy clothes, not even put decent food. I don't know what kind of system was it. I have to find out why he didn't make more money. I will. What did he do for a living? He worked in the factory. You know what? After 20 years after I went home after the war, I asked my dad, what are you doing in the factory? And he said he couldn't tell me it was a, it was a secret. So I don't know what he ever did, but all I know, he worked in the factory, but his hands were his hands like a surgeon. So my dad, and I told dad, I said, dad, you said you're working hard, your hands don't show that. But, so I don't know what he did. Really? <laughs> I don't know what he did. Wow. <laughs> you went to Germany? Well, Went to Germany is uh, an understatement. I was taken, you know, I, I, just real quick, it, it was after the Christmas holidays in 1944, a German officer came to the school room and told us that get ready in a week, the whole student body will be dissolved, the boys have to put uniforms on, they're gonna have to fight the Russians, and the girls will be taken into, into Germany. Well, that little village that you've seen, that's what they took us and just dropped us off, and, and that was it. Is this your school? That's the room. Do you know how we sat in school? Not like this. We sat like this. Yes, sir, like that. That's how we sat in school. That's me right over there. Where? First, second bench, the second one to the... Okay, second one in. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. See the stove over there? Yes. The world map? Yeah. In Europe, we, we, the European system is education, education, education. No football, no queen at the football game, nothing like that. <laughs> now. Is this one grade or a combination of grades? But this was, you know what? This was in eighth grade. Eighth grade. Yes. And that's how far I went to school, because the war was over and my school went down. It's an all-girls school? I see no boys here. Yeah, no boys. Thank you, Lord. We got a long time without them. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> you have a basketball team or anything? No, no. no. So we, we did, you know, ex exercises. That's, okay. that's all we did. Yes. Okay. And uh, we shot here three girls. Who are these three girls? No, that, that's me in the middle, and that's my two girlfriends. Okay. Uh-huh. You're fairly attractive. Well, and by the way, we all spoke, all, everybody spoke three languages, so that's the reason, if you're wondering sometimes why I'm a little confused, but when you hear three languages, you have to, my family spoke in three languages. So what are the languages you speak? It was German, German, Slovak, Hungarian, and then I learned English. English was the hardest, sir, yeah. because the pronunciation. I had to say, our classroom has large windows. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was a, was a little hard, trust me, it was. But I love English, it's the best language. So life was somewhat hard. Oh yeah, up, it, yeah. It, it was, it was learning. But in a way, school meant everything for me. I'm very curious, you know. Eleanor Roosevelt said if she would be a god, if she would be a, uh, what do you call these godmothers that give gifts, she would give to every newborn child the, the gift of curiosity. I'm a very curious person. Ladies, not nosy. There's a difference. There's a difference. <laughs> I was curious. Well, you, you're very smart, very sharp. Well, yeah, well, I was a math major. I was good in math. Algebra, geometry. In third grade, we had ge ge uh, geometry. Algebra, I was wondering, what do you, why did I take an algebra? How do you use, why do you use it? How do you use it? Well, I found out. If, an in, if they have to figure out when water gets underneath the building and they, they build those big pylons, P Y L L A N, and you know how the, the reporter asked us, said, Sir, that happened in, in Chicago. And the, the reporter asked him, I said, Well, how did you figure out how wide they have to be and how tall? He said, Well, have you ever heard about algebra? So, I'm ready to build. <laughs> Algebra. We got a shout here to mom, dad, and the uh, family, I think. Okay. Yeah, here is dad. Oh, my dad always knew every answer, and my mother was a very quiet person. By the way, my father was an atheist, and our life was woo, thunderstorm. This is my brother, Benjamin. 
This is my sister Bridget. She became a psychiatrist. This is me, and Edith became a ballerina. She danced for 28 years with the Slovak National Ballet. Wow. My brother Joe worked for the bank, and my brother Benjamin was a plumber. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. But you still don't know what your father did in the factory? No, I don't know. Wow. Well, one thing I can tell you, he didn't make any money, so maybe he didn't do much. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But you met a fellow over there. Yeah. And it looks like this fellow here. Oh, oh. man, wasn't he good looking? Hey. <coughs> Somebody told me he looks like the uh, actor Tab Hunter. Does he look like Tab Hunter? Do you all know Tab Hunter? Of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> you know how they. <laughs> you know. Well, tell me how you met him. Well, no, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't romantic at all. He was the cook in the kitchen, and I was the dishwasher. And he made such a mess, I got even with him. I married him. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, you were not wealthy at the time, of course, and you well, didn't have any shoes? Now, well, in the kitchen that I went to work, I had one pair of shoes left over from home. And my shoes gave out, and I went to the shoemaker. I said, don't come here anymore. There's, I cannot repair those shoes anymore. They're irreparable. So I went to work the next day, and my, my mess sergeant said to me when I walked in, well, what's the matter with you? Why are you making a long face? Don't, you don't want to work anymore? Sir, I'm hungry. I, I don't have any money, no food. I got to work. But my shoes gave out. No problem. That's what I like of Americans. When you, when you tell them you have a problem, excuse me, you know what they would say? No problem. No problem. I'll call the supply sergeant. He did. I want you to issue my worker a, a pair of Shoes. Well, I got combat boots. Do you have a picture of them? Yeah, yeah, let's see the boots. There they are. And they are heavy. And I, I weighed around 90 pounds. But in those things, you know, you have to t imagine when, I, when those bells, they were clinging. I said, oh, those are dinner bells. That's OK. That's how I went to work. I worked in them almost a year. Mm -hmm. But your uh, husband-to-be was attracted to those boots. Oh, yeah, those boots gave me away. <laughs> now, we got a shot here that, uh, I don't know how this fits in, General Eisenhower. Oh, well, Jen, he was my man. He, he liberated my word. He was in charge of that big war. He's a hero. And I lived, uh, we lived in Pennsylvania, only 30 miles from his Gettysburg farm. I, he's my hero. And all General McClark... All of them. I, I will tear up when I think of such good men. I, when I met Americans, they were su such honest and good men and such happy men. I have never met any happy people until the 101st Airborne drove in that village. Really? Yeah. Wow. But you know what? They looked a little scary. They had those helmets on, nets on, leaves all over them, beards, and everybody was... Chewing, and I told the girls, I said, you know what, we're not the only ones that are hungry. Those guys look hungry to me. <laughs> they were not hungry, they were chewing gum, and we don't have chewing gum. <laughs> yeah. On the, the back of that picture, uh, it says, you're about to embark upon a great crusade. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of the Almighty God mm -hmm. upon this great and noble undertaking. Mm -hmm. We have a shot of a large building here, four-story building. What is this all about? Well, now, this is where the Germans, when they took us away, here's where they dropped us off. This is a sports hotel. Uh -huh. And we were up there on the top floor. And when D-Day came in May 1945, the white flag was on a church building waving. And, and I had all the butterflies in the world were in my stomach because I used to listen to the radio, and Hitler always said, don't take anything from the Americans, they're going to poison you. So I was, I was afraid of, of, of them, of America. But it didn't take long. I got a job. I was eating. Hey, we were friends. We were friends. <laughs> and you came to America on this ship we we're going to show. Oh, my. Oh, yeah. The Queen Mary, this right? Is, no. Oh, yeah. QE2. Now, this was a troop transport. There was 350 people on that thing. Oh, and I want you to know, those of you that don't think that we have enough water to, to flood the whole earth, trust me, I saw all the water. We can be flooded over and over. Nine days on the water, I said, Lord, in my prayer, if you bring me across this ocean, I will worship you and I will never forget you, and I never have. <laughs>
Did you get sick on the ship? No, no, I didn't, because I was told by somebody uh, that if you keep a stomach full, you know, the ship goes like this, and your stomach is full, you'll be really? all right. I ate th so much that the, <laughs> the cook from the, they used to come out and look at us and who, because I said, and I need some more pancakes and more pancakes. I follow instructions, so that's one thing you can depend on. If you give me good instructions, I'm going to follow them, and I ate and I never got sick. Everybody else was laying on the floor, but not me. <laughs> not me. <laughs> now, what age were you on the ship? When I was, I was 21, sir. 21. They called us war brides. So, now when we came to New York, by the way, I'm going to tell you, when you come to New York in the end of September, and it's the fall of the year, and the st stars are out, New York looked like the biggest Christmas tree I've ever seen. But that's not what fascinated me. There was a big ball in the sky, and I'm out on the deck, and I said, my word, what is that big orange ball? Finally, <clears throat> you know, my curiosity, an officer was standing there, I said, sir, tell me, what is that orange ball in the sky? And he told me, ma'am, that's the moon. <laughs> <laughs> I said, the moon? I said, sir, you know, I really thought that was the advertisement for Coney Island. Because in the kitchen, there was one cook. Oh, if you ever come to New York, that could have called me Alan. But guess what? I know that officers that, oh boy, are not a dumb immigrant. <laughs> if you don't recognize the moon, what do you think he thought of me? <laughs> what were some of your feelings when you embarked off the ship, when you, when you departed the ship? Well, uh, what can I say to you? So the war, the six years of war that went home, nothing. and. Nothing but hell every day, and finally I'm coming to a land that is free. I don't know what I thought. I was just, I was thankful that I was offered a ship. <laughs> how, much, I, how much money did you have in your pocket? Well, to be honest with you, none of my I, business. No, right? I don't think I had even a dime. Well, <laughs> they told us a day before we landed. Now nah, these these soldiers, that, these men that were waiting on you, they're private citizens, and you, you, they will, you would appreciate if you give them a tip. Well, you gotta have money for a tip. I didn't have any. And then the Lord takes care. The next day, announcement comes everybody's gonna get $10 back. Victor and Jesus, I gave him $10 and got a tip. Walk of a free citizen. <laughs> Did you have a place to go when you arrived? Yeah, my husband was there. He picked me okay, up. Okay. But there were several ladies that the men did not come. But, my, but I thought, well, if he does not come, I had a very expensive camera. I would go to the pawn shop, oh. get a ticket, and go to the company commander, and he would help me. Okay. Yeah, that's, I already had a plan. <laughs> I think this may be out of order. We had a shot, shot of you in the clouds here in the mountains. Oh, but look at the, those of you, there's several of them here. We've been in the Alps. That's what the Alps look like. Oh, you haven't lived unless you've seen the Alps. Now, I admire the Rocky Mountains and all the, and the Andes, the Himalayas, Kilimanjaro, you name it but there's nothing like that. Nothing, not likely, nothing like well, that. Well, you know why, sir? There's a little villages there, little church buildings. Though. It's just charming, wonderful. You look like an angel here in the, <laughs> in the mountains. Now, we had a shot of a house here. Is this the house in Pennsylvania? Yes, yes, sir. Now, this house is a miracle how we got it. The gentleman next to me, the neighbor, he sold the land, and we paid him $500 every month because when you borrowed money in those days, the land had to be paid for. I didn't have any money for the land, but we built it. Remember the church built it. And in the big house, the bus driver used to say the Prasa Mansion. Well, this was a mansion, isn't it? Sure. The first house, we rented for 16 years. We had four bedrooms, to, um, and the boys had a whole basement to play in. It was a wonderful house. And you started a family here? Yeah. The payment was $110 a month, sir. Oh, that's my family for Easter. Now, there we are. Sandra, she does not know. This is Tim, Peter, Bob. No, my husband looks like a sergeant. That's what he was. <laughs> I had to tell him one day. He was giving me orders. So I told him, I said, Pete, you know what? Something dawned on me. You know what? <clears throat> you are in the army, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I was not in the army. <laughs> and the shot of the original restaurant. Oh, yeah. Oh, my word, yes. Oh, my word. 1976. Uh -huh, this is, this yes. is in Nashville, right? Yes. In, well, <clears throat> excuse me. It was really Hermitage. 
Okay. Wasn't it beautiful? Wonderful. And the best thing was, we were the third restaurant that opened up. When we opened up, that restaurant went up like a rocket. We, we killed ourselves. The buses came, the people came. And Ginger, remember Charlie came over and helped to clean tables for me? Oh, yeah. We shout at you uh, sitting on the step here. I guess this is in front of the restaurant. Oh, well. yeah, no, well, my word. Everybody was young at one time. No, <laughs> we don't look at pictures like that anymore. <laughs> and we got the menu here. Yeah. This is the outside. Let's take a look at the inside. Mm -hmm. On the inside, there's some prices here. Uh, 225 for lunch, <laughs> 325 for the evening smorgasbord, 25 cents for dessert. Yeah. I ate there last week. I didn't pay those prices. Well, so things have changed, trust me. We, ne we, we should have charged. Tim, where are you? We should have charged a whole lot more money. No wonder we didn't have any money. <laughs> uh, we had plenty of plates, trust me. To walk, I mean. What do you enjoy so much about the rest of business? People, people tell me, well, Ms. Prasa, did you do all the cooking? No, I do all the talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. I do all the talking. And the, the, the decor of the restaurant, tell me about it. Well, I, I did not want my guests to come into a restaurant with horns and walk into a barn. I wanted you to come to a place like the grandmother's house back in time. And I have oil paintings, I, ha I have old f antique furniture, you know, and I play good music in the evening. When Tim is there for lunch, it's hip hop. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But I play piano music, soft music, and I have to tell him, Tim, don't play that music. One gentleman told me one, one day, Miss Prasa, can you turn that, that, that music off? I cannot eat as fast as they march. <laughs> <laughs> the food was very good. Everything I ate last time was good. What is your favorite dish? Well, what, my favorite dish is that I don't have to prepare anything. <laughs> I can eat anything. <clears throat> So when you were raised like I was raised, trust me, I was raised on wa uh, water, or soup, and a piece of bread. That's what we ate at home. Wow. I will eat anything. Food is not my problem. Where did the apple fritters come from? My husband. <laughs> well, I told everybody it's a World War II recipe, you know, little, can little balls, you know. So uh, one day he said to me, Margaret, you know what, there's a recipe that I've been wanting to try. I said, well, go ahead and try it. And he put it out there, and yeah, and from now on, we'll have to have the fritters. And, and I, Tim, who was it? What football game was it? The punter loved our fritters. He was playing in New York. Something in Auckland, and all at 8 in the morning, said, Miss Pras, I have an emergency. Well, what is it? I need two dozen fritters. We are flying them to New York because our man is over there, and he's depressed. We're going to lose that game. Two dozen fritters, boom, to the airport, and then we have, and guess wow. what? The, the banner, which we don't have anymore, lovely paper, <coughs> conservative paper, had a big headline and said, Fritters cure jitters. Yeah, he saw the fritters and he he's revived his spirit and they won that game, sir. It's my fritters. <laughs> 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 They were, uh, he played for Vanderbilt, yeah. So uh, another picture here. You have a picture of one of our presidents. That's our president. That's our president lives there in the, in the palace. And this is, this is on the Danube River. That castle and the churchman. And we had 16 coronations in my hometown. Honey, I have blue blood. I just don't tell anybody. <laughs> and uh, uh, Mr. George Bush, our president, came and honored us because they separated, we became a free country. Did you so, meet him yourself? No, I didn't, no. Okay. My family just sent me the propaganda. Okay. okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, let's go back one to the okay. picture of the city. This is the capital city? Yeah, that's the capital of Bratislava, yeah. That's, that's How do you church. pronounce it? How do you pronounce it? It's very easy. Okay. In, in three syllables, a bad child, brat, brat. Is, is in lava, mountain lava, Bratislava. Okay. You all remember it now, okay. <laughs> it dates back to the Roman era, mm, on the Danube. I've seen ships on the Danube going to the Black Sea, lived in a very interesting concert. We had it. What are the differences between America and your country in the past? What, what, what well, compare, I, compare the two for me? Actually, very little, sir, because our, my, my people, they love freedom. Are people the same all over the world, do you think? 
Oh, in a sense? Oh, oh, oh no. Uh, no, okay. No. <laughs> Tell me the differences. No. Well, <clears throat> for instance, the Russians never had freedom. Under the Tsars, they didn't have any freedom. And under communism, 70 years. By the way, I went to Moscow, missionary trip, and uh, went to the Kremlin, went to the cemetery where all the hunchmen were buried. And Khrush remember Khrushchev, anybody, when he came to America and said, I'm gonna, we're going to bury you? Oh, yeah, well, we bu he's buried, but not with honor. <laughs> but we are still here, yeah. Well, and then you have um, the Austrians are laid back, the Germans are hard workers, highly disciplined. Missouri, our Truman, president, he's got German blood in him, trust me. Well, the Italians, you know, oh, mamma mia, you know. We went to Italy with the bus, the Italians, they, they sing a lot and work some. <laughs> Is there a common theme, though, among peoples that we all want freedom then, or not? The, com the common theme is, and only America can, uh, can produce that, just to love everybody. We don't make any difference in America. In my rest, in rest in our, excuse me, Tim, in our restaurant, we have white collar and blue collar people eating together. In Europe, uh, you, there's a big difference. If you're not educated, you go on that side and there. But America is different. Americans are humble, humble people and, and happy people. Nobody, trust me, nobody in the world is as happy as you all are, really. No. And, and I said to somebody from communism years ago that Americans should be the proudest people in the world because of what we have, but yet we're the most humble people in the world. We don't make any difference in people. We accept people the way they are. And, uh, well, there's no place like America. If, you, if I talk about America, we'll be here till midnight. Do we appreciate what we have in America? Well, some do, the older generation, that the young people have a lot to learn. Well, but it's going to get better now because people are talking more about even trusting in God again, in God we trust and appreciating spiritual things. In Nashville, look how many churches. Is. In Hermitage, again, I've seen two new churches uh, being built. I tell everybody, come to Nashville. That's where the heart of America is. And music is the language of the heart. Come. If, if you want to speak a language that you don't have to learn, just come to Nashville. Because <laughs> we have the music. Yeah. Some is good and others is, you know, so. <laughs> Let's go back to uh, your country where you have a shot of you by a pump. Yeah. T tell me about this. Is this uh, your house? Well, no, yeah, this, we were exiled. My, my, I told you about my three aunts. We lived in Bratislava in a beautiful house, but they got rid of us, and so we, that's where I live. This is, I went back home to visit, yeah. It was, it was let's see, 100 feet, 100 feet by 80 feet. And it was a black fence around it. I couldn't even look out. And when, I used to envy the doves. They could leave, but we couldn't. You know, it was a black fence. We couldn't look out. My father, I don't know what, who, why he did that, but he did. He, in. My father was never mean to us. He just didn't believe in God, you know. But my mother, oh boy, she, my mother was an angel. She, she not only believed in God, but she always thought, tell the truth. Tell, my mother said, if you, don't, if you lie, you're going to have to keep notes. And then she said, if you lie, you will steal, because they are first cousins. And that came in very handy. Tell the truth. Now, nah, at times I have dif had difficulty telling the truth. But one story I have to share with you. In the kitchen while I was washing dishes, in came the inspector, and that was an officer. Americans are so clean. Everything has to be so hygienic. Honey, when you go to a board, you're hungry. You pick up a piece of bread from the ground and eat it. Don't think anything of it. So in comes the... And he says to me, Margaret, I want to know something, sir. Oh, man, what does he want to know? So he looks under the radiator over there. I said, look, under that radiator, how long has it been that you swept there? I said, oh, shucks, I didn't even know we had a radiator in the kitchen. <laughs> Never. Now what I say to him, I'm depending on them. They're feeding me. I, oh, by the way, no pay. I got three meals a day. That's all I got. But at least I was not hungry. And so I said, oh, I hear my mother tell the truth. So I told him, I said, sir, well, really, never. He said, it's a good thing. Well, that's exactly what it looks like. So, <laughs> see, the truth saved me. Sure. One more true story. When I was in the, in, in the Alps, 
we were in a, in, we, we were in a, in a certain place, and there was a big orchard next to us, and apples were on it, and we were hungry. There was 40 of us in that little room, and we had ch children too, and, and our little boys that went back into the farmers and brought the food in. So I told my girlfriend, let's go over there to those apple trees. Let's go get some apples. Well, I had an apron. She had an apron. We were over there, and I looked at those apples. Oh, shucks, they look good. Again, I hear my mother's voice, don't steal, ask. So I told my, my girlfriend, we're not taking anything off our tree. Look, these apples, are, they are good. We'll pick them up. I picked them up. And as I was picking them up, all of a sudden, the farm door opened up, and out comes and she yelled at us, gypsy thieves, I'm going to call the police. For a minute, I lost my speech. Not for too long. <laughs> <laughs> I, turned, oh, I turned around to her and I said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Every Sunday, I see you going to the church with, with a book and with some beads. And we're over here, 40 children hungry. And I didn't trust, touch one apple. I wanted those rotten apples from the floor. And you would... I couldn't finish my sentence. All of a sudden, I hear a horse galloping. Here comes an American soldier on a horse. Well, my girlfriend, she, she spoke better English than I do. Her father was a lawyer. They have money, so she learned English. But anyhow, the soldier said, what, girls, what's going on? And so she told him, we didn't touch an apple. We wanted those apples, but she cussed us and cursed us. She's going to call the police. Boy, he reared that horse around and said to her, you go inside, shut up and close the door. And girls, open up your aprons. Oh boy, he picked the best apples. We had apples everywhere and he galloped away. I truly believe it today that it was an angel from heaven. There, I, there were no Americans, I never saw one any there. But he came out of nowhere. So anyhow, if you tell the truth, God will give you apples, good apples. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Well, since you brought up angels here, let's talk about becoming a Christian. How did yeah. that happen? Oh, sir. Now, that, that take, I'm going to make it very short. Becoming a Christian, my husband was fighting in Korea. Every day the news came on, and I ran, in a, I lived in a trailer that I hated, but my husband said, we're going to save money. Oh, <laughs> that's a different story. But anyhow, one morning, at Wednesday morning, I didn't get there in time to turn it off. I was raised in a church. Never heard the word Bible. What is the Bible? Never heard. What and church so, were you raised in? I was raised in a Catholic church. Okay. Total darkness. In those days, ooh, there was nothing but purgatory. And who the heck wants to go to purgatory, you all? <laughs> Life is almost the hardest purgatory. But anyhow, he was saying that Wednesday, if you never had a Bible, how do you know you're right with God? And I thought, what does he mean, a Bible? What is a Bible? I've been going to worship for 25 years. And so it got my curiosity. I couldn't wait on the next Wednesday, next Wednesday, next Wednesday. Finally, he, he said one Wednesday, if you will send, send, send me and invite me, I will come. He came with his wife. I sat in the middle. And I had, meanwhile, I had bought a Bible because I went to market. I saw one and I purchased one. And uh, so I had it on my, but I didn't know what to do with that book. So she, his wife said here, and he said here. So I had a thousand questions, and we studied the Bible like for two hours. And um, I was amazed. I said, this is God's word, and I didn't know it. And so they said to me, well, Margaret, we have a gospel meeting tonight. Uh, we'd like for you to come. I said, well, I'll come if you invite me, but you're going to have to come for me. I don't have a car. My husband sold a car because I don't drive, and he went to war. I'm here with two kids, and I got to have... I came, picked me up. So I'm walking in that building, just like this building, nothing on the wall. I'm used to going in a cathedral with gold, pearls. I said, oh man, these people must be poor. They don't have anything on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, the preacher's sermon, that the first sermon I heard was, let your conscience be your guide. And he said, your conscience can be your guide if it is guided by the word of God. Well, that made sense. Well, the sermon is over, and you know how friendly you all are. I'm there, I'm, I'm scared even to be in that building. Everybody's around me, and then comes the visiting preacher. And here's what he asked me. Well, now, Margaret, do you believe that Christ is the Son of God? Oh, yeah, I always believed ever since I was five years old. He says, well, what hinders you from being baptized? Well, I was thinking of a hindrance. I didn't have one. I have to be truthful. So I don't have one. I was baptized the same night. <laughs> Been to the church ever since. The best, 
Best day in my life when I found the Bible. Oh my, oh, what can I say to you about the Bible? If you don't read it, you're cheating yourself. Because, you know, so many people, I feel so bad for them. You turn television, they're crying out. They wanna, want God to speak to them. Well, pick up that book. He's talking to you. He will talk to you day and night, but people don't pick it up. Now, I want them, somebody knocked on my door and said, Miss Pastor, we're having a big tent meeting, miracles, cures. And I'm, a, I'm at home with my kids alone. I'm cooking supper. And I said to myself, sir, look, I am busy. You don't have to invite me to a big tent meeting to make me believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe it without a miracle. I don't need a miracle. <laughs> they left me, so I never came back. So, <laughs> Do you need a miracle? What did, what did John say? Truly many other signs that Jesus in the presence of disciples, but these are written that you might believe, and believing you may have eternal life. Hey, you read what God wrote, and you have eternal life. So. You have been back several times on tour with tour groups, is that oh, correct? Oh, yes, uh-huh. And so some of these people have gone They're with you. They're here, yes. They, they will all tell the truth. Pretty good tours, yes? <laughs> <laughs> tell me about some mission efforts that you have been involved in in, in supporting uh, mi missionaries. Mi missionaries, well, yeah. oh, my word. How I about mean, Bible smuggling? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I never smuggled Bibles because, see, I was a former Czech citizen, and I, there's no way I could. I never even went home. It was 20 years be, after the war that I seen my parents. I was afraid to go. I wouldn't go. And a Texas missionary, Bob Hare from Dallas, Texas, six foot four, says to, uh, had an article in the Gospel Advocate. If you have family behind the Iron Curtain, if you write me, I go visit them. I wrote him, and he went to visit my parents. I lived in Pennsylvania at that time. And he baptized my, my sister, my, my father, my brother. And uh, I supported Eastern European Mission from the get-go when they started, OK? And then Romania had a need for Bibles. And, and I talked to somebody who, who knew how to raise money. And we raised around $2,000 and, and sent it to Romania. And it is because of those Bibles that we the money that we raised for Romania is that, that we are in a restaurant business. I never wanted a restaurant business, Tim knows it. I, but anyhow, that's the way it turned out. We, uh, we had a call from somebody where I went to raise that money. The, I told the gentleman, I said, look, if you want to make some money, you ought to go in business with my husband. He's a good cook, I know. So he said, well, all right, let's get into business. So we did. He came to Nashville. My son Bob was at Lipscomb, and they had a daughter in Lipscomb. We put our heads together and started a country house, Schmogelsbad, on Dickerson Road. Maybe somebody would remember that. And, um, and, and that's how it started, because I went to him. To Mobile, I flew to Mobile, Alabama to raise money for Romania, Bibles for Romania. The Romanian government was so broke, and they, they, they agreed to print a Bible for $2. So we raised this. He was able to. This preacher was able to, to raise, write a letter to the churches, and money came in. And then I mentioned to him, "Hey, you, you and my husband ought to get into business." That's how it started. We got in, went together in business. If he, if I don't get that letter from Vienna, Margaret, please, emergency. We need money for Romania for Bibles. Well, in Pennsylvania, we were mission field ourselves. So. We got our income tax return back. I got a ticket and flew to Mobile, Alabama. Met, met that, uh, that gentleman, and he wrote a letter to the churches, and we raised the money. And that's how we got to be in business in, here. In. So if you want to be in business, get involved in mission work. Trust me, you'll see what the Lord will do for you. How would you sum up in a few sentences your story of Amazing Grace? You've shared it tonight. Over well, the course of the last 45, 50 minutes, but if you had a Yeah, well, you know, I told you I didn't know what I was going to say. See, when you talk? <laughs> How would I sum it up? Thank God that I'm in America. Thank God I'm a Christian. Thank God that I have the word of the Lord. And thank God that I can meet on the Lord's Day with my good Christian, with my family, the family of God. There ain't nobody any happier than I am. I love, I love the church. I love America. I love God, and I told him at my funeral, just say she loved God, she loved the family, she loved the customers, 
and she loved her friends. So. I'm glad you came on the ship, the troop ship over here with your boots and made it to America. Oh, yeah. Oh, hey. <laughs> you have any questions for, uh, for Margaret? Uh, I asked my mom one time, face to face, and I wanted to know what was so special about my dad and why she fell in love with him. Do you remember what you told me, Mom? No. <laughs> no, I don't. She said he's the most handsome man she had ever seen. No, he was. He was. He looked, yeah, hey, amen to that, yes. He was a good-looking man, huh? Yeah. Well, Larry, uh, is that all you want to know? Well, <laughs> unless you've got something else to no, share. No, so no, I'm no, not. Stay married. there. Don't, don't, don't leave. We're glad that you... Uh, could be a part of our audience, part of our uh, well, Stories Grace and Grace. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed it. And uh, you have a lot of information to share. And um, I do like those apple fritters. If you could save some of those for the next time well, I come. Well, Larry, buy. I made a promise to you. You will get fritters free as long as you live. If you uh, find me somebody that can help me to write a story, I'm going to write my story down, but I don't have time. Yeah. I need a ghostwriter, not a real, but a ghostwriter. Don't send me a ghost, I won't write anything. <laughs> My life may be short, so I may be over next week. Then. <laughs> Let's have a prayer before we go. We want to give you a Story Amazing Grace mug to take with you so you can oh, put some of your you. coffee I, in at the restaurant. Oh, yeah, I drink coffee. Yes, sir. Thank you. All righty, let's pray. Father, thank you for Margaret and uh, her great influence that she's had on so many people that uh, come to her restaurant and she's uh, associated with. Her leadership in the community in Donaldson and being part of the uh, Chamber of Commerce there and, and civic groups and the way she has supported missionaries throughout the years and just her, her positive attitude and her Christ-like spirit. We're thankful for her, Father. Continue to be with us as we live our Christian lives. Help us to be a great influence to those that we come in contact with every day. We pray through your Son. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us.